Welcome to Speaking Truth to Youth. I'll start by just starting with question number one. What events or beliefs in your youth led you to become an activist? Activist was not an idea that ever occurred to me as a young person. I was much more motivated by my family's sense of responsibility and commitment to each other and to the community. And so this notion of the golden rule of do unto others as you would have them do unto you was the kind of foundation of the guideline to how one made choices about what you did and what you didn't do. Being born into a matriarchal family with aunts and uncles and living intergenerationally for the first six years of my life. So I had the modeling, very intense and very close modeling of actually how you do that. How are you cared for and how do you notice people caring for you and caring for others? And always with this little golden rule in the background of Betty Jean, would you want that? to happen to you? Oh, well, then you probably don't want to do that to anybody. So there was always that sense of awareness and the encouragement to be aware of what was happening in the world around you in terms of the community. There was that. And with that, one was aware of what was right and what was wrong. And this sense of fairness, you know, kids have a very strong sense of what's right and what's wrong. What's fair? You know, that's not fair. Kids just know that's not fair. So I think that was planted in me as a seed very early on from the very beginning. That's what motivated how I related, how I understood the world. Going forward a little bit from your youth, Can you give us any specific times where that kind of came into your being and influenced how you acted? A very good example. I wasn't sure I was going to give it, but now that you ask it in that way, when I was in junior high school, I was born in Ohio, raised in Ohio, small rural town. Our schools were integrated. We weren't, it wasn't a segregated town, you know, in the sense of schools and public facilities. It was segregated unofficially by where people live. And it was a, a, a special kind of community in the sense that unlike the wonderful story, uh, the warmth of other suns that talks about the migration of African Americans from the South to the North, but her stories were all about going to urban areas. Whereas where I grew up was the migration from the South to rural areas. And that rural destination was a very different configuration from the urban destination. So my family's migration was to work in brick mills. The brick mills provided housing for its workers. And that housing was multiracial and multi-generational and and international. I grew up in a community of people who spoke different languages and looked differently than my family. They were dependent on each other and they all lived next to each other and shared facilities and worked in the same company. So I didn't know segregation in that sense. And so there were assumptions that were made that weren't always true, right? Uh, This story kind of comes out of that in the sense that uh, I had a sense of what was right and what was wrong. And race was color. Race wasn't a factor in the way people ought to be treated. So there was a restaurant in town. I had heard that some kids had gone in there and had been served on paper plate and had not been served on regular cutlery and regular things, plates that were washed and put away and used again. So I decided one afternoon at lunchtime to walk into that restaurant and order food. And it was brought on a paper plate and I refused to eat it and I refused to pay for it and they refused to change it. And so I walked back to school and reported it to the principal. He called my dad to come and pick me up and my dad intervened and talked to the owner of the store who my dad knew from his days living in town. I don't know exactly what transpired between them, but I know that paper plates were never, ever again used for people who went into that restaurant. My dad was a very active, vital member of the community across race, across class, was one of these very well-respected and cherished people. But I do remember him saying, 
that won't happen again to me. We never had a conversation about it, except that won't happen again. I never felt like, oh, I won. I never felt it was a battle. I just felt this isn't right and something needs to be done about it. And I just did that. But it did give me, I think, some modeling of, yes, you can make a difference. And if something's not right, you just do something about it. I must have felt safe enough and secure enough by my family, by my school, by my community. I didn't have the message that I needed to be worried or scared. I just needed to make a point. I needed to lift it up into the eyes of people who could do something about it, like my dad. And I didn't have to tell him about it because I hadn't experienced it. I had to go do it first. Th that's the story from my activist. Even though I had, I wouldn't have named it that, I would just have named it like, this isn't right. And I I'm going to go in and see if that's really true. Let me see if that really is true. And it was true. That is um, such a great story. We talked earlier about the importance of people hearing everybody's story. I'm thinking of you and Claudette Colvin. Her stakes are a bit higher. But it takes that courage and the, the idea, you're right, of saying, this just isn't right. What continues to motivate you to be an activist that guides you, gives you courage? What keeps me hopeful and gives me courage uh, is my history, actually, of how I did become an activist. And it really began with leaving this country for 15 years, moving to Europe and getting out of this country. Honestly, I wasn't aware that I was leaving for any particular reason other than adventure. And it was after I had been in the Peace Corps, coming back and then being graduate school and then going to Europe and experiencing in international life in a lived way. I mean, certainly being in the Peace Corps in Africa was international and a lived international experience, but it was still under the supervision of a big daddy, <laughs> you know, the government, but going to Europe kind of much more on my own and getting involved with becoming a yoga teacher and studying Buddhism and art, going to art school and experiencing as a young adult really this development and building of community and what that looked like, which was very nourishing and very intentional and very generous. And it was a great time. But coming back to this country and being reminded of the challenges of race here, not that I wasn't aware of it before I left, I was here during busing and teaching California during busing when that busing was legislated, but coming back and uh, with a daughter who was six and having her called a nigger on the school bus in Cape Cod really was shocking. And it wasn't shocking in the sense of outrage. It was shocking in the sense of what? What's going on? I was more curious than I was angry. And I think curiosity is really a very good strategy for staying out of suffering or navigating suffering. That kind of ignited my understanding and need to become more active in this brokenness of this community that I had moved into on Cape Cod. It was an insight into there's something really wrong here and I need to get involved in figuring out how to fix it, how to mend it, whatever is broken. And to do that, I think was really from childhood, uh, knowing that the golden rule, do unto others, you would have them do unto you. You know, what's going on that somebody is doing something unto me that they really wouldn't want to have done to them. And maybe they, they don't know it. So how can they find out? I'll have to tell them. How do we do that? Let's find allies. Let's find companions. Let's find mutually shared values among people. Let's put out the word that this thing is broken and I found out about it and what can we do about it? It was the beginning of organizing in the community, starting with the school, to educate and to provide opportunities for kids and families to meet each other and to see each other and to figure out what's going on. So why that's hopeful is that people were responsive, that there were a community of people who shared my values and who were willing to raise their voice. It wasn't an aggressive, angry, hostile way, but really these are our children and they all deserve to be cared for. Uh, and we all know how we want them to be treated. 
how can we make that happen? And if there are children and families who aren't feeling a part of this community or aren't sharing these values, let's find out why not. That was the approach. In that engagement, I got involved with an organization called the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, which was the first international women's organization that had a branch on the Cape where I live. I got very involved with that organization and it was a big learning experience for me. Uh, and kind of a progression of what I really knew is that community and building community and circles of people sharing the work is really how things get done. This was a women's organization. So I really grew and developed my own kind of political awareness and understanding through women and through circles of women around all kinds of issues. I mean, race was certainly one of them, but disarmament was a big one. War toys was a big one. This campaign against war toys for children and the environment was a big issue. War, anti-war, it was an anti-war organization it started in World War II. The hope and the courage comes from this resilience that I feel among people. We are resilient. Every generation that comes along has its method of resilience and it keeps happening. That gives me great hope. Many of the people that Robert has sought out and painted are examples of the hope and the courage that is all around us. Listening to you, I'm struck by theme in your life of curiosity that has allowed you to go into places that maybe a theme of anger wouldn't have allowed you to go? I think my ability to approach it with curiosity has a lot to do with my family's instilling in me that I'm okay, that I'm really beloved, and that I believed that I was beloved. The examples around me, the way I was treated, and I wasn't the only one. Children were beloved. That sense of I'm okay, it means that something's not wrong. Something's wrong outside of me. It's not inside of me. So I'm curious about what's wrong out there that's creating this discomfort. I think it's so important that children are given that message, that they're okay, that they're beloved. And it's a message that I, I want to give children and adults too, because we're beloved on a deep level where life is sacred right? And we are life. What advice do you have for youth activists today? I think the first thing is to be joyful. Be joyful. Surround yourself with people who are. Find out where you come from. Because ancestors are key allies. Our ancestors are here for us in powerful ways. I would encourage all young people to interview their grandparents, interview their parents, their aunts, their uncles, anybody they can find that's connected to them. And even if they aren't connected to them directly, indirectly, they're still their ancestors. Be curious, be joyful, be aware of who you are, where you come from, use that as your own strength and power. I would also recommend young people to seek out other people who share their values and their curiosity and create circles of sanity around themselves. Have those opportunities to step out of the chaos into the sanity, into the joy, allowing themselves to just wonder, to be in the magic of wonder and imagination. I would also encourage them not to be bystanders. When you see something is wrong, name it, speak about it, but to also be really careful to speak so that people can listen to you and then to listen so people can speak to you, to value the power of communication. And that goes two ways. So those are some of the things I would want to be in conversation and am in conversation with people, young people about this notion of knowing that you're okay. So you don't have to lead from brokenness or defensiveness and being curious about the conditions and the people who want you not to be okay, to be in community. Nothing happens for me if it doesn't happen for others. If it's just for me, it's not sustainable. It's got to be our liberation, as Martin instructed us, it's, it's interconnected. And to cherish those ancestors and value the intergenerational power of knowing and healing and being with that. I would say all of that to a young person. <laughs> Thank you so much, Betty. I really appreciate this conversation. 